Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to give you this extremely brief and limited introduction to Marxist political economy. Um, I remember when uh, Dee was approaching me about the class and there was going to be an hour per session and, and two sessions, I was really, it was quite a challenge for me to figure out what exactly can I impart about Marxist political economy within that amount of time. Um, I actually usually teach economics at a college level, and I am in a heterodox department, which is awesome, which means that I get to talk about Marxist political economy sometimes. Um, and so I've tried to condense it as much as possible and also kind of give you the reasons behind why it's so important to understand Marxist political economy. So shall I go ahead and begin, Dee? Sure. Okay, cool. So here we go then. Let's do our very best. So the first thing that I would like to cover with everyone is why study Marxist political economy at all. And so pictured here, we've got Adam Smith, we've got John Maynard Keynes, and this guy over here, Milton Friedman. Uh, these are usually the economists that you will run into in rather orthodox uh, economics departments. These are the people who, at least in the United States, have been considered to be the most influential economists of uh, capitalism and definitely of our day and age. However, um, I don't believe that to be true. I actually think that uh, Marxist political economy is the very best. And so hopefully this will help you understand why, and also not just why it's the best, but why it's important to study. So. This is the type of economics that is most relevant to our class and therefore to our cause. So you are at a Communist Party event, and so obviously the type of economics that we are going to be studying will be Marxist economics, but we don't just study that because of the name. Um, it's also just the most relevant kind of economics to study, and it's also the most relevant kind of economics to most people who don't really think all that much about economics, except you know when is our stimulus check going to come in? Um, or I can't make rent, or why is it that you know I lost my job? Why can't I get a raise? Why can't I join a union? These are all questions that Marxist political economy can answer a lot better than, for instance, Milton Friedman. So the divorce between the, um, the discipline of economics and political science is meant to sort of mystify both. Uh, I think it's better to call it Marxist political economy because I don't really think that you can divide those two apart. Nowadays, when you take an economics course at most universities, you're going to be bombarded with a lot of stuff that exists in sort of the abstract and the theoretical world. Uh, and you're going to come into a lot of, uh, you know, formulas and numbers and stuff. And I think that a lot of this is meant to kind of mystify the discipline. When I'm teaching economics at a freshman level, most of the students will ask me, you know, oh, do I need to be a math major? Do I need to understand, you know, how to do logarithms? Do I need to be really good at pivot tables and Excel? And the answer is no, you, you really don't. It's not as mystical as I guess the academy has made it out to be. Marxist political economy is primarily materialist, right, and not idealist. That means that it deals with things that exist in the real world as they are and not as things should be, right, which is another thing that you will find in most economics departments is that people are going to be talking about under perfect conditions or when nothing else is interacting with this, then this is what will happen. But, you know, Marxist political economy understands that Economics actually lives in the real world and so is going to be reflective of real world conditions. It's not going to be something that we wish for or that we hope for. It's simply examining what it is that's right before us. Marxist political economy, um, I, for the reading, it was the Communist Manifesto, the introduction and the first two chapters. And, you know, it sort of opens up with this salvo of saying that all of history is about that of class struggle. And as we look around the world, Today, we can definitely see that there is a lot of struggle going on around class. And so again, this is going to be extremely relevant to folks. It identifies history and society as the basis for analysis and not necessarily the individual. So especially in you know, neoclassical economics or neoliberal economics, you're gonna find a lot written about the individual and what the individual thinks and how the individual is going to react to a certain kind of situation. 
But Marxist political economists, they understand that history and society is what informs the individual's decision making. And so that's sort of where they jump off, which I think is for the best. And yes, so exactly, it's a type of economics that is based in the actual world, which is why I find it to be the most interesting and also the type of economics which is going to have the most liberatory potential when it comes to putting it into practice. It also offers a meta approach to economics, situating the discipline itself as part of history and class power. So when I say that in the United States, you are not likely to take a course on Marxist political economy as part of your college education, that's because we live in the United States, or most of us uh, on the call are living in the United States, right? And we can look at who it is that's in power, what it is that's going to benefit them the most, and that's probably going to be the type of economics that folks are gonna learn. It's just like history, you know? It's like, who is it uh, that's in power? They're obviously gonna want you to teach their version of history, not the version of history that challenges the power structures as they exist. And so that's something that I find really awesome about Marxist political economy is that it's critical um, and that it sort of understands its own place in the world a lot of times. It is also an approach that can be immediately taken up by workers, right? So millions have already learned the basics without even being able to read. I thought it was great because when I was working as a union organizer for um, the Hotel Workers Union in New York, when I would talk to people, I wouldn't have to say, oh, you know, I'm a Marxist or this is about economics. People were really easily able to understand, you know, basic terms like surplus or, for instance, the concept of your boss wanting you to work twice as hard for less money and twice as fast. These are all, you know, really simple things for people to understand. And we can't discount the fact that there have been billions of people who have risen up against the capitalist system over the course of history and they were able to do that without sitting through you know two one-hour lectures um, on video chat so it's possible to grasp this it's it's really quite simple uh, it speaks to our conditions in a way that bourgeois or capitalist economics does not necessarily so you know, one of the things that I like to do when I'm teaching is, is invite students to come in with sort of a case study example of how they can apply what they're learning in class to the real world. And oftentimes, that's pretty simple to do. Unfortunately, since I've been teaching, we've been through a lot. Um, there have been a lot of really exciting developments uh, in political economy. And it's very easy for people to be able to connect the concepts to what it is that's going on in the real world in a way that I think that most orthodox economists aren't really necessarily interested in doing, right? Because then you can kind of shake out where it is that they're coming from. Remember, they are sort of in a country that is run by capitalism. And maybe think to yourself, well, I don't know if it's if it's necessarily all that complicated. I think that maybe they're just trying to pull one over on me, which is sometimes the case. So again, if you're looking to talk to people about wages or housing or commerce, basic needs, this is going to be the approach that will most likely kind of gain ground. And the cool thing about it is that it promises both progress and change. Now, this is because Marx's whole method was heavily based on Darwin's study of evolution. And so I like this image in the background. It's supposed to, I guess, show the evolutionary arc of people and how now we're all crouched in front of our computers hooked up to a screen most of the day. Um, Whatever came before influences what happens now and what will happen in the future. So again, this is where Marxist political economy is really quite uh, broad and inclusive. Um, if we're talking about the individual and what it is that's motivating the individual to make certain kinds of decisions, right? Like, well, am I going to go to college or not? We have to understand where that individual is coming from, the society and the history that's behind that decision, right? So perhaps if there is a giant economic crisis like what is happening right now, more people will be going back to college uh, because they might not be able to secure funding otherwise, right? Because people can take out student loans to go to school um, and because the job market might not be that good. Now, when a bunch of people who aren't able to find jobs take out massive amounts of student loan debt and then graduate into a job market that maybe cannot accommodate them, 
they're going to be in debt now. And that's going to influence what will happen in the future. So it doesn't just sort of capture one moment in time. Marxist political economy tries to include as much as possible in order to give a proper analysis of the situation and perhaps the best way forward. Everything changes. This is a really important part of this evolutionary process, right? Is that nothing is ever going to stay the same. Um, lots of people have ideas in their heads like, well, you know, humans have always been capitalists. I've really honestly heard people say that or that, you know, the roots of capitalism, you know, this has always been the way that things have been done. You know, people have always needed money. Nothing is free. You know, people get locked into this kind of idea of what is forever. And that shuts down any kind of hope for change in the future, right? People will throw up their hands and become demoralized and say, well, you know, I might as well just go and become a trader on Wall Street or something if they're in an economics program. But Marx's approach promises change, right? Because that it isn't a hope, it's just how everything works, right? Everything does change over time. And it also focuses on trajectories instead of static situations, which is extremely important. I think that nowadays, with the way that capitalism is developing, um, there is more of a pressure to turn around results very, very quickly, right? So sometimes people will make major decisions with lots of money, lots of people's lives on the line, just looking to see whether or not they can pull a, a profit out of the next quarter right, which is, you know, three or four months there, and people are, are, are going to be making these decisions without looking at necessarily what might happen afterwards, or if they are looking at what might happen afterwards, it doesn't concern them as much as just what will happen in the immediate situation. So lots of people are going to be trying to capture these static um, situations and, and make policy around that, but it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I mean, if we think about all of the things that, you know, folks have been through in this political economy that we're living in right now under COVID, there has already been so much change and so much flux that has happened since the beginning of the year when the whole pandemic kicked off, right? You saw unemployment rates go up and down. You saw, you know, a change in government in the U.S. You saw a giant uprising for black lives and against the police state that was happening. And so if you were to try and make some sort of decision based on a static person, you know, uh, someone who is unemployed and who has been unemployed uh, for at least six weeks, you would really want to think about the trajectory of how things are going instead of just examining their static situation, right? So you give people $1,200 earlier in the year, what's going to happen when people run out of that money? Or is there going to be a possibility of being able to continue that kind of aid from the, from the state? These are things that are important to take into consideration when you're looking at how to solve situations. Uh, again, sort of it's this, this idea of the Washington consensus versus the world systems theory, which is a totally different class, of course, but it's, it's sort of pointing out how bourgeois or capitalist uh, economic decisions might be made that are very sudden without taking any kind of uh, history into account, like, for instance, the uh, terrifying legacy, genocidal legacy of colonialism, right? That you would be able to make these sorts of economic uh, policies out of nowhere without taking any of that into consideration. That's not true. Uh, that's very situational, whereas world systems theory looks at the global economy in a way that's relational and also takes into account uh, history. So again, back to trajectories. Um, the thing about Marxist economics or the Marxist political economics is the primacy of economic class, right? So again, the opening lines uh, to the Communist Manifesto are the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles, right? And the quote continues to go over all of the different types of classes that have existed uh, in, in uh, conflict with one another. But then, you know, finishes up the quote by saying it's a fight that each time ended either in a revolutionary reconstitution of society at large or in the common ruin of the contending classes. So what Marx is saying in the Communist Manifesto is that these classes exist in conflict with one another. And when conflict takes place, there is some sort of change that happens from that, right? And we can scale this to look at very small situations or very large situations. 
But Marx is saying that there's either a revolutionary reconstitution of society at large or in the common ruin of the contending classes, right? And if we look through history, we can see this play out again and again through revolutionary situations, um, not just in that moment of conflict, but all of the smaller conflicts that build up to that, right? So in the United States, there is a serious problem with uh, racism and white supremacy, right? And there have been many battles that have been fought along the way. It's not something that has completely been resolved yet, but those are situations of conflict that do produce change over time, right? So who is it that runs the show? Um, generally, the show being the political economy or the situation that we're in. Uh, Marx describes there being dictatorships of certain classes over another. And so sometimes if people you know, want to challenge you on, on Marxism or socialism, they'll say, well, you know, you, you people are all just dictators. You know, it's a, it's a dictatorship. We look at these figures in history. They were all, you know, dictators. But what Marx says is that there is no such thing as just one person who can be in charge of everyone else, that it is a class that rather holds sort of um, primacy over all other classes at the time, and that all of the decisions that they make are in a sort of dictatorship kind of mode to um, maintain their position, right? It's to reproduce their own class position. Uh, and that usually means by oppressing and exploiting people who are underneath them. So we can look at different types of economics that have existed throughout history. We can look at feudalism, mercantilism, colonialism, and we can see again that there is generally one class that has complete control all over, over all other classes underneath, right? And so in this country, where we live, I'm asking you, what class is it that is in charge of capitalism, right? And so this would be the bourgeoisie and the capitalist class. These are people who have a dictatorship right now. So when Marx talks about the dictatorship of the proletariat, he is simply talking about that power dynamic being shifted upside down, right? That all of a sudden it is now the workers, it's the people who are producing all value who are able to run the show, so to speak, and that all other kinds of classes are held subordinate to them. So, this does not minimize other forms of oppression, right? So sometimes you can talk to people who say, well, you know, class first or class is the most important thing. But I like to think of this saying, which you can really plug a lot of things into, is class is primary, but other forms of special oppression are never secondary, right? So conditions of class exploitation demand other forms of oppression in order to sort of perpetrate and reproduce their own primacy. So this is where you see things like racial oppression and gender oppression and other kinds of forms of oppression. I know that um, the terminology of racial capitalism is a really good term, I think, because it underscores how, yes, we do live in a thing called capitalism, but that thing called capitalism necessitates other forms of exploitation in order to sustain itself, in order to sustain its primacy. I think that what's great about Marxist political economy is that it can help us to understand that oppression, um, sorry, it can help us to understand that oppression, um, it has a materialist foundation, right? And it's not something that's falling prey to idealism or fatalism or utopianism. So for instance, in terms of gender, if people would say things like, well, you know, women are just like that, or men are just like that. Um, that's fatalism, that's idealism. You can't really root that in anything that exists in the real world. You should be able to unpack that question and understand it uh, with evidence and with theory, and then you can kind of work your way through it as opposed to throwing up your hands again, being de demoralized and saying, well, you know, this is just how everything is. Uh, Marxist political economy can help us to identify new forms of oppression, right? So obviously we've had lots of different uh, rights movements that have uh, emerged not anything necessarily super new, but we can see that maybe folks weren't as aware of certain kinds of oppression, for instance, LGBTQ oppression, um, as they are nowadays. And usually that's because people are able to look at it from a materialist perspective and say, okay, this is where this kind of oppression comes from. This oppression is connected to that oppression where you get the double oppressions or the triple oppressions in some cases. Um, and understanding these other oppressions is foundational to perpetrating class oppression. This is how it all kind of connects. So for instance, the idea of ableism, which is the graphic that I have up, 
Um, it is something that is definitely based on the wage relation. It is based on whether or not people are physically able to do work. It's also based on how people are valued in society. And if people aren't producing any kind of uh, surplus value at the time, then you know it's going to be more difficult for them to have accessibility. And so again, this is just one example of how you can perpetrate class oppression through special oppressions. And again, so it doesn't minimize, this approach doesn't minimize uh, special oppressions, and it also does not minimize the existence of the individual. So what's really funny to me about bourgeois economics is that they're always going on about the individual and individual choice and individual rights and things like that. Um, this is supposed to be the primary um, unit in society is the individual and their sovereign right to be able to make whatever decisions and do whatever it is that they want, their liberty, etc. Um, but Marx was really quite impressive in his way of noticing that actually capitalism is what it is in, is standing in the way of an individual reaching their full potential. Oppressed people obviously cannot be their full selves, right? So I love this graphic. This is a union graphic, um, eight hours for work, eight hours for rest, and eight hours for what we will. This was a really important demand out of the labor movement. Uh, the eight hour work day is because people understood that when they were being oppressed, working in factories or you know growing food or other things for more than eight hours a day, they weren't able to take advantage of their full selves, of their full lives. I think that a lot of folks uh, on this call can probably relate to the fact that you sometimes work so hard that you really can't think about anything but work. You don't have time to think about yourself uh, as an individual, what your needs are, what it is that you want in life. Uh, and this is part of capitalist oppression, right? So Marx is not, when he's talking about classes, when he's talking about these broad you know, movements in society. He's not, he's not forgetting the existence of the individual. Rather, he would say that Marxism is about fighting for the individual to actually be who they are. And I think that an excellent example of that is this demand for free time, right? So we're not talking about money yet. We're going to talk about free time because sometimes that feels like the most sought after thing in society because with free time comes so much more, right? Uh, Marx described free time as time for the full development of the individual, right? So there's plenty of things that you can't do with your life uh, if you're so busy working on other things that you can't stop and think and take care of yourself, what people in the movement I think call self-care. Speaking of which, I'm going to take a sip of water real fast because I've been talking a lot. Okay, self-care done. Free time is the time for the full development of the individual. And this is from the Gundrasa, right? So Marx talks about this in a very large book, which were actually sort of his notes for writing the three volumes of Capital that were published. If I have free time, then I am not working, able to think more clearly, develop myself in any way that I like, and most importantly, I am able to evolve and change. Now. At the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis, I think that a lot of people found themselves with their schedules significantly changed. So as someone who lives in New York City, who would spend quite a lot of my day going from one place to another, all of a sudden I saw that there was all of this extra time on my hands, right? And I've been rather shocked over the progression of the year how any little bit of extra time that I once had on my commute to be able to read or you know, listen to music or talk to people on the train or even just walking to and from the train, et cetera, all of that time has somehow been eaten up by extra tasks, right? So I didn't really get any extra free time. If anything, I somehow feel like there's less free time for me right now. Um, because of the way that things have developed under COVID. And I think that a lot of people are feeling like they're stuck in that situation. People who may have lost their jobs, for instance, um, having to go and look for another job, that takes a lot of work. Um, we can actually, sorry, we can, that takes a lot of work to look for another job. If you have to pick up a third job or a second job in order to make ends meet, that's going to take up more of your time, right? Time is something that is stolen away from us by capitalism um, and that we want to 
get back because that's how we can actually sort of develop ourselves as full individuals. And we can also scale this up to class, which is why Lenin always fought for free time, right? Or not just free time, but space to be able to organize. He fought for time to be able to plan and organize that these things actually really matter to our class in being able to, again, not have to work so much, think more clearly as a class, develop itself in what way it likes, and also evolve and change, right? To put up some sort of resistance. Capitalism treats workers as consumers, or sorry, capitalism, my bad. Capitalism treats humans as consumers or workers, but the fact of the matter is, is that we are much more than that. So market efficiency, this idea that we need to be able to make maximum amount of profit from each economic uh, situation kind of demands the standardization of as much as possible, right? And so this goes for things like machines, um, styles, frequencies, operating systems, and of course, human beings. And just speaking like, if I have a cell phone, right, and I need to go somewhere and charge it, there's really only going to be like three or four different plugs that will fit into any phone, right? And so that is basically to try and maximize efficiency. I know that Apple, for instance, has already tried to make everything that plugs into it as something that's very proprietary in order to sort of maximize profit out of that. Uh, how many types of blue jeans are there? Yes, there are lots of different brands, but do we see a lot of variation in that? Frequencies, if I wanna be able to receive information or send information, it's gonna have to go across some sort of standard frequency, operating systems, et cetera, but also human beings, right? Human beings, and back to the idea of individuality, um, are not gonna be able to express their, their true selves. You're gonna want, or capitalism is going to prefer humans to sort of fit into neat little slots in order to be more approachable as consumers or as workers, right? And even in this relation, you know, even in this system, capitalists themselves are actually stripped of their individuality and that they only are there where they are because they're rich. And this is interesting because it's Marx, you know, caring about rich people, but he says about money, he says, it is exactly as if, for example, the chance discovery of a stone gave me mastery over all the sciences, regardless of my individuality, right? He compares it to a philosopher's stone, which is supposed to somehow give you magical powers. For people who are in the, the capitalist class or the bourgeoisie or the ruling class, however it is that you want to cut it, they're generally there, unlike what you would you know, think going to any of the many biopics about Steve Jobs, they're generally there because they come from money, because they've had certain kinds of privileges bestowed upon them. So the way that they live their life is not even necessarily the way that they want to, even though lots of people will say, well, you know, if you have a lot of money, then you'll be able to do whatever you want. Yes, that is true. But again, you're sort of um, constrained by the power that money gives you, right? So again, not even they are able to express their full individuality. And yes, there is no such time, uh, so no such thing as free time for the poor. Sometimes when I am discussing things in uh, class with folks and we talk about unemployment rates and we talk about the social safety net, for instance, and it says, well, you know, what are people going to do for a living if they can't get a job? And people will say, well, I'm, I don't know. And it's like, well, they're gonna have to find some money somehow because we don't live in a society with, you know, free access to healthcare and housing and, and food and things like that. So people have to make this work for them. And that's another thing that eats up a lot of free time for the poor is people figuring out how it is that they're going to make ends meet or how it is that they're going to stay in their homes or how it is that they're gonna avoid the police, et cetera. Um, there's also this idea of being alienated from leisure, uh, meaning that you don't have any, uh, that you use your free time to train, that you engage in some sort of sh side hustle, that you're shopping or that you, you know, you're drinking or partying a lot to kind of escape life. These are, not, these are not examples of free time. These are again, sort of things that capitalism can, can encourage you to do in order to become a more efficient worker or consumer, right? So I have three jobs now and I picked up one of them because it was like, well, you know, I've, I've got some extra time and things are tight, so I might as well be using that time to try and 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 make money i mean this is this is a robbery of free time again this is a robbery of people's ability to realize themselves fully as individuals training right so maybe you know you use your free time to pick up a different language or learn a new programming language you know again this is all about you being more 
uh, marketable or more standardized as a consumer or a worker, right? Shopping, of course, people need to shop under capitalism or else, you know, things will fall apart. Uh, but even this idea, and I think nowadays in the U.S., there is a lot of trouble with addiction, uh, especially under the COVID-19 situation where people are isolated. Um, and so instead of feeling like they're able to change life, right, they sort of uh, cover that up with some sort of substance, whether that's playing video games all day because they're depressed or whether it's drinking. I know that alcoholism is really off the charts right now. So I think what would be fun is between now and the next class, if people could kind of think about who or what is it that is dominating my free or surplus time. So if you've tuned in to hear about Marxist political economy, you're probably asking yourself right now, why is it that I am talking about free time or human beings and how they're seen as the market, right? Well, I think that this is a really good opportunity to segue into this idea of surplus, right? So the cool thing about Marxist political economy, again, is that it's all really historically situated. And if you spent any time looking at the assigned readings, uh, which everyone should read the Communist Manifesto, it's great, uh, then you were probably reading about history and how it was that humans developed. Now, I included this photo in the background. This is the oldest known grain silo that they have found uh, arc archaeological evidence for and it's located in Jordan in the Jordan Valley and it was discovered to be from about 11,000 years ago. So the reason why I'm talking about grain silos, hang on, um, is because grain silos in terms of our historical record uh, indicate a really important time in human development where for once people had more than they needed immediately, right? So for hundreds of thousands of years before capitalism and before the police and before nation states and so on, um, people were, were sort of just making ends meet as they could. They were known as hunter-gatherers or they were living some sort of nomadic lifestyle, but the appearance of grain silos in the historical record indicates that people had more than what they needed for immediate use, right? And so they were able to store these uh, this extra surplus, whatever it was that they were growing or whatever it is that they had more of for later, somewhere. And so they would have these grain silos. And generally, you know, you build this grain silo as sort of a community effort. And then because you have this surplus, you're able to develop a little bit more as a society, right? So maybe now people have a little bit of extra free time. They can kind of learn how to do other things to develop as a human species. But there is also going to be a group of people who are probably in charge of this surplus, right? And how it is determined that they are the people who will be in charge of this surplus, uh, it's generally different from place to place. Sometimes I like to think about the Vatican as being a giant grain silo because religion was really one of these things that was created to sort of manage surplus, if you think about it, right? Um, all of these laws connected to God about who gets what um, and why, et cetera. So surplus is, is really, I would say, the most foundational um, concept that we could talk about today. Hang on. Oh, it plants the seeds of class structure, right? Because there are people who are out gathering this surplus or growing this surplus or manufacturing this surplus. And then there are the people who are deciding what to do with the surplus or the people, if you have sort of a democratic uh, prehistorical society who have been selected to decide what to do with the surplus, right? And so now not everybody is just trying to make ends meet, uh, put food on the table that night. Now we have people who put food on the table and then you have people who are going to be in charge of the surplus and maybe, out of that situation, you're also going to develop people who are in charge of uh, figuring stuff out, like you know how to grow more food or how to, uh, what do they call it, domesticate animals, or maybe people who are gonna do art or people who are gonna do writing, things like that. Uh, but you end up having these seeds planted of class structure at least about 11,000 years ago, as far as we can tell. Uh, and again, going back to this idea of uh, Marxist political economy, and some people, if you've taken a political science course, will hear that, you know, political science is about who gets what, when, where, and how. I mean, that is the point of political economy. I, I don't like to separate these terms out because who gets what, when, where, and how is not simply an economic question. It's deeply political, right? I mean, this is something that is uh, 
the heart of most class conflict that we're experiencing today and also throughout history is is deciding this and figuring it out um the how of it you know but also the why oh that's not included there anyway so right now this is just sort of the opening what i'm hoping is that you have learned through this talk uh, why it's important to learn about Marxist political economics, how it is that Marx kind of sees the world where the method came from. Uh, and we talked a little bit about surplus, but in two days, I will also be giving another hour long talk, uh, wherein I will be touching on things that are a little bit more applicable uh, and not so theoretical. Although I hope that a lot of people can kind of pick concepts out what I was talking about and apply them to what it is that's going on in their lives or in the world around you. So I think that next time we speak, we will be talking about the role of the state, right? Because that is clearly an extremely important part of Marxist political economy. Uh, ideas about colonialism and imperialism, you know? I mean, where did these things come from? How is it that they kind of sustain capitalism? How is it that they expand capitalism? Uh, ideas about alienation and dispossession, right? So everybody who has been stuck on Zoom or go to meetings or, you know, not necessarily in the world that they're used to inhabiting uh, have probably felt some bit of alienation and this idea of dispossession as well over the last year. So we can talk about that. And also, I think the most important part of Marxist political economics is this idea that a better world is possible, right? What is the point of knowing anything about economics uh, if it's not going to lead you to some sort of change, some sort of promise of a better future, right? And so that's something that I think Marxist political economics is very good at doing, is, is trying to uh, open the doors to that. And so I hope that you will tune in in, I guess, two days time and we will discuss those points together. And like I said, you know, this is very brief. This is very um, short. This is not as much detail as I would like to go into, but I am always a little bit intimidated by the timer. And I see that I am about 20 minutes left. So that is the conclusion of my lecture, but I would love to hear if anybody has any feedback or questions about anything that I've given so far. Okay, Taryn, we'll open the floor uh, for que uh, questions and comments. Um, so uh, our uh, format, uh, let's hear from a few people and then uh, after a few people have introduced a question or a comment, then we can turn the floor back over to you. And okay. then after that, hear some more questions and comments, okay? Okay. Okay. So uh, the floor is now open for questions or comments. What you need to do, we will not be able to read questions or comments. Uh, what we need you to do is, is uh, use your mouse to click the picture of the hand to indicate you want to speak. So if you'd like to speak, introduce a question uh, briefly or make a comment uh, briefly, Please click the picture of your of the hand. Click the pic, click the raised hand icon, and we can open uh, your mic. Okay, Terry, your mic is open. Hello, can you hear me? Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, in relation to the slide that expressed um, Darwin's influence on Marx. We sometimes hear the critique make itself heard of stagism in Marxist political economy. And how, as a Marxist political economist, do you answer that critique? Okay, let's... Let's take a few more questions or comments. So looking for raised hands, if you'd like to speak, um, click the picture of the hand to indicate you'd like to speak and we will open your mic. Andrew, your mic is open. Click, there you are. Hey there, uh, I 
from reading chapter one of the Communist Manifesto, it, it talks about how all of the different classes of like feudal times, medieval times have kind of been boiled down to just two, which is working people and, um, you know, the bourgeoisie capitalist class. So uh, two questions. Is there much of a distinction between bourgeoisie and capitalists? And also, I mean, that does strike me as a little bit simplistic. So I, I, I'm just wondering, let's say within the United States or just within the global uh, order in 2020, does that still hold? I mean, would you maybe divide that into further subdivisions? Okay, thank you. Looking for raised hands, click the picture of the hand to indicate you want to speak. Looking for raised hands. We will not be able to read uh, so uh, your questions. Joy, uh, open your mic on your end. Just click your mic. Use your mouse to click the mic. There you are. Thank you. Um, before I ask my question, I just want to say, Taryn, I thought you did such a fabulous job. I heard people speak about things like this, and it was as if they were perched above materialist explanation of something Marxist, but kind of talked about it from heights. And you were almost storytelling <clears throat> and talked about things we would know and be familiar with. I just thought it was such a great job, so thank you. Um, <clears throat> what you presented today was presented in a platform sponsored by the Communist Party. I'm just wondering, if you were to talk in a platform sponsored by, say, Democratic Socialists, would you have presented something different in any way? Okay, Taryn, so you've got three uh, commenters, so, or questions, so maybe you want to jump in there. Sure. So I'll work backwards uh, with Joy. Thank you for your comments, Joy. Um, would I say anything different to a group of democratic socialists or anyone else? I don't really think so, because this is supposed to be a discussion. Well, it's a it's a presentation. I'm sorry. I wish it were more of a discussion um, about Marxist political economy. And so I don't think that you can really uh, gloss over what it is. I think that to do that would be misrepresenting it. I think that if folks are maybe focusing on one particular issue, so for instance, I know that the DSA is very uh, interested in Medicare for All, which of course everyone on this call I hope is extremely interested and very invested in seeing that happen. But if that, for instance, is like a certain campaign, I might try and focus things around what people have on their minds right now. So maybe it would be from more of a perspective of why healthcare is for profit in the United States, uh, maybe try and teach through what it is that they know. I think that that would probably be my only difference. And that goes for anyone. I mean, when I was working as, a, as an organizer uh, for a union, it was always talking about people's working conditions, you know, and that would be hotel rooms or how many rooms you need to clean per day or whether or not you were asked to do something when you weren't clocked in. And I would basically do my best to try and describe to them everything that I just said, but through the context of where they were. I think that that is the most important part of being a Marxist, uh, certainly someone who would say that they wanna teach about Marxist political economy is being able to speak to people where they're at um, and not come at it from some sort of uh, academic or elitist position because I don't want to uh, I mean it's great I am involved with my union of course the the PSC the professional staff congress at CUNY um, and so yes some of my time is spent trying to galvanize academics but I think that from the CP's perspective it can't just be towards uh, academics or for people who already have a very solid grounding and understanding uh, in the terminology that we use. I think it's up to us to try and speak to people where they at 
where they're at no matter what. Um, so yeah, I think that's why it's important to try and keep things simple. If folks want to get into the nitty gritty about certain kinds of concepts, then I'm happy to have that conversation with them in a different venue or maybe later or under different kinds of circumstances. But if I'm speaking to a call of hundreds of people right now, I kind of got to assume where like the baseline is and, and go from there. So then Andrew's questions about working people versus the bourgeoisie, um, the distinction between capitalists and the bourgeoisie, whether or not these things were too simplistic and whether or not we need to have more. So I think that there are certain kinds of analysis uh, that are going to split up those categories a little bit more, but I think that the problem that I have in trying to whittle everything down to certain kinds of situations, you know, I know a lot of people will talk about service workers as opposed to manufacturing workers, um, or they'll talk about teachers, or they'll talk about doctors, or they'll talk about Uber drivers, you know, we've got gig workers, we've got professional workers, we've got academic workers, we've got, you know, service workers, uh, factory workers, people who produce our things that are all the way across the world, who are working in conditions that are completely unimaginable, like something that Engels would have written about, um, terrible conditions. I think that the problem with separating people out from each other is that we lose sight of the fact that it is really just one system, right? Um, that no matter where you live in the world right now, no matter what economy you uh, purport to live under, you are having to deal with the indisputable fact that we live in a world market, right? And so even if you are extremely isolated, your economy is extremely isolated and you're only able, able to trade under certain kinds of conditions and, you know, maybe everybody only speaks one language and, you know, all these different things, even if you're isolated, you are existing and your economy is existing within that larger picture, right? So I would be hesitant to separate people out like that. I think that if you're going to talk about capitalists, if you're going to talk about the bourgeoisie, that it is probably important somewhere along the line to, to update the terminology a little bit when you're talking to people. Um, obviously, the capitalists of 150 years ago look and act and are very, very different than the ones there are today. I think that there wasn't the same degree of lionization or, you know, idolizing people who are in power like that. Um, so I think it's important to try and unpack that, especially this idea of, oh, well, you know, I worked to get here. Um, you know, if you're a member of the bourgeoisie, maybe, you know, I, I worked hard to to have my business or something like that. But but understanding that it kind of all comes from the same place. So again, kind of connected a little bit to what Joy was saying, I think it does depend on who it is that you're talking to and why, um, what the venue is, what the circumstances are, and how to reach them best. If you're speaking with gig workers, for instance, if you're trying to organize a bunch of Uber drivers, then it would be a good idea to try and focus on gig economy kind of subject matter. And uh, figure out how that's different than maybe other kinds of jobs that people have held in the past and articulate how it's different, but also not separate them out because really whatever happens to one set of workers kind of has an impact on all workers. And likewise with the capitalist class or the bourgeoisie, you know, uh, it's a class thing. It's also an individual thing, but it is in, in a major way a class thing. And so trying to split people up too much kind of reduces our ranks and well, not reduces our ranks, but separates us and makes it more difficult for us to proceed uh, moving as a class towards, you know, improvement and change. Um, and then Terry asked a question about Marx and Darwin and this critique of stagism. And so I wish I could ask you to clarify a little bit what you mean by stagism. Uh, do you mean this idea that once you go through one stage, you move to another stage and then to another stage, or that you can look at, at one society and say they're in this stage, and then, you know, I don't know, could we ask Terry that? To clarify? Terry, your, Terry, your mic is open. Uh, sure. Um, what I'm talking about is 
when we compare political economies, not just over time, but also from place to place, and of course, you know, multiple political economies exist in both space and time. Uh -huh. um, how does Marxism, Marxist political economy answer the critique that um, some societies get labeled as backwards? Ah, I see what you mean. Yeah, I think that's pretty sloppy um, terminology if people are using it, and I'm sure that people are using it. Uh, I think I've read stuff where people are, are kind of falling prey to this kind of mentality. I think that understanding that development isn't linear, that development can go in many different ways. And that's why I think it's so important to look at trajectories and be able to make decisions because if everything were so preordained, then we wouldn't really need to do anything, right? We could just sort of sit back and, and let things take us to where we are. Um, I think it's really critical, again, to look at things through a historical lens, uh, through a global lens, uh, and see where people are at and why, and also understand that things change all of the time, and that sometimes societies are like one way, and sometimes they're like other ways. I think that labeling economies and societies as backwards is extremely chauvinist. I do not think it's helpful um, at all, especially when we're having a a very kind of basic discussion trying to to reach out to people about the basics um so that's i guess how i would answer it i would say that that seems really sloppy and not really focused on our class and on um, what it is that we want to achieve by talking about marxist political economy you know i hope that that answers the question okay lennon your mic is open Lennon Hoover, your mic is open. Speak up, please. Lennon Hoover, speak up, please. Your mic is open. Lennon, your mic is open. We can't hear you. Okay. Molly, your mic is open. Click your mic on your end. There you are. Um, thank you. And thank you, Taryn. Um, I just really want to echo, I believe it was Terry, just huge appreciation for the way that you did this. Um, it's really exciting to, to learn from you. And I just followed you on Instagram. I just kind of want to check out more of your work. Um, yeah, the, the part the part that really stuck out to me was talking about Lenin's demand for free time um, and this this whole you know association of free time being a part of surplus value the surplus value that is stolen by the capitalist class um, and that religion is one of the institutions that was created to manage all, all different types of surplus including free time um, I just I'm just sitting here just thinking about free time and and like that as like a demand um, in our organizing today. Um, and I think about how there's different types of free time. And one of the one of the things that you do in free time is rest and you heal. Um, and, and another thing you might do in free time is you um, organize politically. Um, I know you went into that a little bit. Um, I guess. You know, my, my comment is is mostly a comment, um, not much of a question. Um, and I think that like free time can also mean individualism, and um, it could it could mean like the libertarian definition of freedom. You know, and so I wonder if like it might be worth being more specific as we apply it. What what is what is what is freedom really? Um, today what are we talking about when we say that word yeah thanks okay looking for raised hands lennon i will open your mic again now you click your mic on your end 
Lynn, there, your mic is open. Please speak up. Uh, uh, excuse me for the interruption. And uh, excuse me for the technical difficulties. However, the questions I had gathered, I guess, pre-reading, I had revisited the manifesto, but also Engels's principles of communism. So, with that, I would I would offer: Is there, say, any difference between the the points said within the Communist Manifesto and Engels's principles of communism? And the second point, second question, I'd like to say: When when saying in the terms of uh, talk as if you're meeting where they are. How would you how would you say that from a petite bourgeois or small business owner, tiny capitalist sort of perspective? Okay. You mean how you? Oh, sorry. Okay, uh, go on so he can clarify. Oh no, I just mean, do you mean if you're going to be trying to talk to a small business owner? Yes, indeed. How would you, okay, okay, got you. Thanks. Okay, looking for raised hands. Okay, Jenny, your mic, click your mic on your end. Hover your, there you are. Speak up. Thank you very, thank you very much. And Taryn, a very interesting and, and very useful uh, presentation. I wanted to pick up on what you had said about the primary contradiction and, and secondary contradictions and specifically gender, uh, but also to pick up then on the issue of free time, because the the approach that, that we have adopted is that the race, class, and gender contradictions are actually profoundly inseparable, and that the gender division of labor, particularly in social reproduction, is the locus of where the gender inequality comes from. And that element of social reproduction for me is a fundamental part of how the capitalist system takes away free time from the working class. So even in fighting for an eight-hour day, the free time that, that is gained is in fact predominantly used for reproduction of the class. So if you could just reflect on that, that would be great. Thanks. Let's take one more. One more, Taryn. Okay, yeah. Okay, looking for raised hands. Looking for raised hands. Okay, Yusef, your mic is open. Click your mic on your end. Hover your mouse over your the picture of your mic, click it, and your mic will open on your end. Hover your, 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 um, there you are. Okay, uh, you didn't call my name. Uh, uh, I said, you, speak up, please. Oh, uh, do you hear me? Yes, we do. Oh, okay. Uh, one short comment. Uh, I am reminded uh, of reading that in a, uh, a Black Sea resort in Soviet days, apparently there was a big billboard that the Constitution guaranteed the right to relax. Uh, so, uh, okay. In a um, discussion in, in New York uh, about Marxist theory, and I uh, think this goes back to stages. Uh, the conclusion of the group was that a uh, unstated uh, assumption in Marx was technological and economic development, and that uh, uh, if, like something like a climate disaster or nuclear war happened, uh, you know, all these things would fall apart. Uh, so, would you agree with that? Uh, and maybe could you uh, elaborate on that? Uh, uh, point. One more, um, Taryn. Okay.
OK, uh, if you'd like to speak, you have to uh, click the picture of the hand and leave it clicked. All right, Thomas, your mic is open. Hi there. I wanted to echo Yusuf's question about technological development, um, uh, how, how technological determinism plays into Marx. Um, I think about that a lot uh, with Malthus and Ricardo and how Marx kind of resolves that contradiction to me. Um, I also wanted to ask about uh, character masks and, uh, and what are your thoughts on the concept of the character mask and Marxist uh, ideology? So that's, that's all my questions. Thank you. Um, Taryn, do you, I think I saw one more hand. So um, let me see. No, go on Taryn. Okay, so I'm going to try and condense some of these and answer them as completely as possible, even though I know we are running over time right now. I can see that people are starting to hop off the call. So if you wanted to ask something and you didn't get the chance to, um, you should probably tune in in the next two days and we can discuss it further. Um, I wanted to go back to this idea of free time, but also as it relates to this idea of primary and secondary contradictions. So I think that to Jenny's point, this idea about gender uh, oppression and racial oppression being integral to class oppression, like I completely agree. And I think that that's why there was the slide that said that, you know, class is primary, but whatever gender, race, et cetera, are never secondary issues is because they are absolutely incredibly linked. And I think that if we wanna talk about free time escaping us uh, under COVID-19, that people who are gender oppressed, right? People who are women um, or people who suffer under the patriarchy have had to definitely put in a lot of work that maybe folks weren't so familiar with before. Um, I know I'm reading horrible uh, nightmare stories about women dropping out of the workforce, for instance, because now that schools are closed or maybe people don't feel comfortable sending their kids to school, uh, people are being forced to take care of their children um, and that generally this sort of falls along patriarchal lines on the women. And so, yes, of course, these things are extremely integral. There are a couple of books that I really like that talk about gender oppression as being integral to capitalism. Uh, Sylvia Federici's Caliban and the Witch is something that I think a lot of uh, young women in my generation really appreciated and, and saw a lot of value in as describing, you know, this enclosure of the commons, not just being about the land, but also about this idea of uh, other people's bodies to be able to produce uh, and to reproduce the class. Uh, obviously, if people are working in factories 14 hours a day, they can't really take care of themselves and all of the needs that they uh, need to meet in order to stay alive. So obviously that is a huge part of how capitalism sustains itself, uh, ramming gender relations down uh, the throats of working class people is part of a process of colonization and imperialism. Like it's very, very deep, this idea of gender relations. Um, and so I would in no way try and make that into a primary and secondary contradiction. I would say that they are absolutely sort of wrapped up in each other um, and that there's been a lot of really excellent work to sort of expand on what Marx and Engels and folks have been writing about uh, before to, to, you know, like I said, it's a, it's an, it's a, it's a, a method that you can apply wherever you are, wherever you're standing. And so obviously things are going to change. Um, you know, Marx didn't have social media to think about when he was writing. Um, and that's a huge shift in the way that society uh, is structured and also the way that capital reproduces itself and the way that classes are reproduced as well. So yeah, there's that. This idea of, of appliances, this is what popped into my head as you're talking about free time, and I know some other people were thinking about technology as well. This idea that, okay, so, you know, certain sorts of things are invented uh, ostensibly to help women around the house, you know, like washing machines or 
uh, dishwashers or vacuum cleaners, et cetera. And yet, you know, that free time never really seems to get brought back into play. And I think that this is kind of where I want to touch on Molly's question as well, this idea between about free time as not being something that can encourage individualism or, or libertarianism. And I, I wanted to bring up this slide again because there's this idea of alienation from leisure. And I don't know, I need to read this piece one more time, but I might just ask if we could get it sent out to folks who registered for the call to read before the next time. I mean, if folks are interested, but this idea of being alienated from leisure or alienated from your free time, right? Of course, there's this idea of not having any kind of free time, but using what free time you have, i.e. the time that you are not engaged in wage labor and might lose your job if you're not doing work, um, using that to somehow make yourself into a more uh, appealing worker, right? So I, I use this idea of, of using it to train, right? So maybe you want to learn a different programming language, but in a lot of circumstances, you're also going to find people who who say, well, I need to go work out because if I'm not physically attractive at my job, then I'm, I'm going to maybe lose it or I'll be put in a situation that you know, I don't get a promotion or things like that. Like there are lots of different ways to look at how people are alienated from their free time. And so I think this idea of being able to, I guess this idea of thinking of free time as something that's like individualistic, I don't necessarily buy that at least at this point in time, because I don't think that people working on themselves in individualist ways are necessarily them being able to engage in free time because I don't think that we can properly enjoy our free time under the system that we live in right now. So, you know, individualism, what is it that people do to be individualist? Um, if we were in some sort of classroom setting, I would want to get some kind of uh, clarification on that from Molly because, you know, is it is it spending a lot of time doing stuff around the house like playing video games or is it something like working out or is it something like you know watching youtube videos to learn how to put on makeup better or is it about you know watching youtube videos to figure out how to fix your own sink because obviously you can't afford for a plumber to come through i mean there are lots of ways in which the way that we spend our free time is not actually free time at this point right it's something that's either making us into better consumers or better workers and of course we can put um, reproductive laborers under the category of workers here as well, right? Um, so that's the free time slash gender pod that I had. Uh, this idea of, and hopefully a little bit on the technological side of things, but I think since we're going a little late, I might try and put some of the stuff that was asked, like the um, technological components of Marxist theory into like the next uh, part here. The, the two days from now, but to kind of connect back to Lenin, what Lenin was saying about Engels' principles of communism, I haven't read that in a while, and I just got done with my semester, and so I am surprised I'm able to like sit upright to be able to give this talk at the moment, although I'm loving it. This is like the best part of my week so far. Um, so yeah, I, I'm not, I wouldn't be able to articulate to you the major differences at this moment, uh, but speaking to small business owners or people in the petty bourgeoisie, I think it kind of goes back to this idea of why are you talking to them and what is it that you are trying to get out of a situation? You know, yes, of course, small business owners, they belong to a certain class of people that have their own interests, right? The petty bourgeoisie as you articulated. But under the conditions of capitalism as we have them right now, small business owners right now in the United States are being wiped out left and right, especially under COVID and being taken up by monopoly capitalism, right? So we have Amazon who has now expanded their operations significantly. I found it kind of shocking and upsetting when I go down to check the mail that there are more packages coming through from Amazon than there are coming through the US Postal Service now. In New York City, they've actually set up their own logistics system. I'm assuming other places too, but I've been kind of stuck here all year um, to be able to deliver on that. You know, this is a this is a shocking thing that's happening. Uh, this huge concentration of power and wealth and capital into smaller and smaller hands. And I think that trying to discover why a small business owner is invested in their small business, what it is that they want out of life for being involved in that small business, and then understanding that under the system we have right now, that is absolutely not possible. And that, you know, as capitalism goes along its merry way, not to slip into stagism, 
uh, that was discussed earlier, we're going to find there being more and more concentration of power and capital. And so it's even against at this point, you know, your mom and pop bodega owners, how things are going right now. Uh, certainly your local restaurants or businesses. Uh, a lot of this goes back to the idea of globalization and what it was that people were able to do for a living after the United States was deindustrialized and uh, labor workers overseas were being able to, were opened up to uh, some serious exploitation in which they live under now. Uh, people didn't used to eat out at restaurants as much, you know, little trends like this have changed along with globalization to put people into different kinds of categories. So I think it's worth revisiting that a small business owner in 2020 is just not dealing with the same situation as people who are small business owners at the time of Marx were dealing with, right? They live in a different kind of global economy. They're facing different kinds of circumstances. And I personally, just from my perspective, think that I would have a lot more in common with a small business owner than I would with like Jeff Bezos at this point, right? And I'm speaking as an individual, well, as much as I could, um, that, you know, if I'm doing some sort of, uh, trying to give food to needy people in my neighborhood that I think that I could probably go and talk up a small business owner to try and pitch in whatever they have extra because maybe they aren't able to move as much um, to be able to help out the neighborhood. I think I get a lot better results out of that and making connections through that than I would through Jeff Bezos. And so in that necessarily, you have to say, okay, there are going to be some practical differences. Um, same thing with, you know, and this is gonna, get me in trouble with somebody, but the idea of landlords, right? So you have um, companies like BlackRock who own massive amounts of places where people are renting to live in right now, right? They're internationally traded uh, mega corporations. Some of the biggest corporations in the world are going to be landlords at this point. And that's very different from like somebody who is renting out you know their mom's apartment that they inherited or something like that so again it's about trying to see where people are at and not saying this is how you should talk to everybody but rather being kind of marxist and being kind of um flexible about things and knowing who it is you're talking to why and what's the best way to kind of reach those people if they're worth talking to in the first place you know which i i think is really important when it comes to this sort of thing so there were other questions about like nuclear war and character masks and stuff, but I would just rather if we could, because I haven't had anything to eat yet. It would be great. If we could talk about that in two days. Okay. So thank you everyone for participating tonight. Please remember this class will resume Tuesday, December 22nd at 7 p.m. Eastern. Thank you, Taryn. Thank you everyone. And hopefully you'll be able to join us, rejoin us, Tuesday, December 22nd, 7 p.m. Eastern. Good night. Have a good dinner, Taryn. Thank you. Take care, Dee. Be well, everyone. <laughs>